Fifty years ago, two scientists made a discovery that would change the world. Jim Watson and Francis Crick revealed the structure of DNA, the single molecule that carries the genetic instructions to build all living things. We'd done something really important. We had discovered the secret of life. But how could the billions of lines of genetic code that make everything from a human to a hippo be unscrambled? What were the genes for eye color, for cancer, for intelligence? Searching for the answer triggered the creation of a powerful new technology, genetic engineering. It enabled scientists to manipulate DNA and transfer it from one species to another, allowing the genetic makeup of plants and animals to be altered in the lab. This work sparked a storm of controversy that continues to this day. We're worried about some of these experiments. Maybe you all haven't thought about them. Why don't we all get together and talk about it? Some saw this work as a threat to humanity. It could be contamination, infections, something that could crawl out of the laboratory, such as a Frankenstein. Others believed it was the future. These experiments offer exciting potential both for advancing knowledge of fundamental biological processes and for alleviation of human health problems. For the first time, humans would have the power to accelerate evolution according to their own design and alter the destiny of life on Earth. DNA produced this brain. The brain understands DNA, so DNA eventually came to understand itself. Inside every cell of every living thing is an incredibly long molecule of DNA. If we could magnify DNA 10 million times, this is what it would look like. Scientifically accurate computer animations enable us to see how it is intricately wrapped up inside each of our cells like a thousand mile long strand of spaghetti. Biologists knew that hidden within these coils were a large number of different genes, but where did one begin and another end? Which genes made flesh and which one's blood? Could they find all the genes that make the proteins of our body? To solve this puzzle, they needed to find a way of cutting the strand into manageable gene-sized chunks. Back in the 1970s in California, a group of scientists came up with a radical idea to tackle this problem. If they could isolate individual genes and transfer them to another species, they might be able to understand how they worked and what they made. No one paid much attention at the time, but a young researcher named Herb Boyer was about to become the world's first genetic engineer. I thought there were a lot of exciting things to do. Within 10 years after the discovery of the structure of DNA, those were my young student years. And young students have no problems uh, thinking that there's nothing left to be discovered. That just happens to old men, you know, <laughs> or older men. They're the ones that think there's nothing left to be discovered. Working in the lab of a San Francisco hospital, Boyer spent his days studying tiny but remarkable creatures, bacteria. Because they are simple and breed rapidly, they make ideal experimental subjects. One morning, a batch of bacteria caught his attention. They contained an enzyme that locked onto the DNA, scurried along its length, and then severed it like a pair of wire cutters. In theory, the strand left dangling could join up with any other piece of DNA. 
When Herb Boyer met Stan Cohen at a conference, they compared notes and realized that between them, they might just have the tools to do something extraordinary. I was very interested in Herb's science. I thought the work that he was doing was exciting, and I thought the ability to use enzymes to cut DNA in a specific way would be very useful for the kinds of experiments that I wanted to carry out. Cohen had spent years isolating genes from various species. Until now, he had nowhere to put them. Among his collection was a gene from an African clawed toad. In March 1973, Boyer and Cohen began an historic experiment to try to get the toad gene to work in a bacterium. Using Boyer's enzyme, Cohen sliced open the bacterium's DNA and inserted the toad gene. But would the bacterium treat the new DNA as if it was its own? In another part of the bacterium, they would find out. When the toad's genetic instructions were translated from DNA code into the building blocks of all life, protein, incredibly, the bacterial cells were tricked into producing toad protein. DNA's instructions for creating living matter were universal. They could be transferred between species like files between computers. The single bacterium multiplied rapidly into millions, each an identical copy of the original. Here was a living factory churning out fragments of toad, one life form manufacturing bits of another. This experiment was a turning point in biology. Genetic engineering was born. It was a moment I'll never forget. I could pretty much see that this was going to change the biological sciences. You know, one of the things that was so revolutionary, I guess, about this technology was that it was so easy when, when we actually did it. News of the breakthrough spread quickly. Everyone wanted to try gene splicing to see what they could create. But just as the new science was about to take off, there were the first rumblings of trouble ahead. When they reported this, I think people were astounded that it could be done that easily. And the promise that provided for new kinds of experimental approaches. But there were a few people in the audience who in fact, we're concerned about the possibility that people would put things into these bacteria that would, in fact, create some public health hazard. At Paul Berg's lab, they were experimenting with genes that cause cancer. He wanted to splice cancer genes with bacteria genes, but his plans set off alarm bells. One of my students had to give a talk about what was going on in her home lab. That seemed to have invoked a huge concern amongst the teacher in that course named Bob Pollock. And Pollock told her he thought that was the most dangerous and outrageous experiment that anybody could possibly do. I posed to her the simple question whether she had thought about the fact that uh, she was bridging evolutionary barriers that had existed since the last common ancestors of, um, of bacteria and people. Berg had proposed transferring cancer genes into a widely studied bacterium called E. coli. Unfortunately, this bacterium also thrives inside the human gut. You have tons of bacteria in your gut. The most common of these is E. coli. My scenario is you handle these bacteria. They have a tumor gene in them. They get into your gut. You have no idea. You don't have diarrhea. You have no symptoms. And they live there. And they propagate there. And they make clones, and they're very happy there. And then a piece of the DNA gets out and makes a tumor in your gut. I called Paul Berg, and um, we had two conversations. The first of which was very abrupt, and uh, I don't think a phone conversation can be thought of as violent, but it was unpleasant. He called me 
to convey his concern. And I said, I thought it was bunk. My first reaction was that this was absurd. I didn't see any risk to it. You ever scratch your head? You ever pick your nose, touch your nose, touch your nose, like that? That's it. Here, that's it. If you're in a lab with E. coli, it brings E. coli into your gut. Simple. I thought that was highly unlikely, but nevertheless, after some consideration and consultation, I came to the conclusion that I could not say with 100% assurance that this experiment would pose zero risk. Berg called for a temporary halt to all genetic engineering experiments. He invited biology's leading thinkers to a summit to assess the real risks. We're worried about some of these experiments. Why don't we all talk about it and see collectively whether there is, in fact, any basis for this concern? Are there risks? And if there are, what do we do about it? It was the period of just after the Vietnam War. People were concerned about doing things that would come back to haunt us. So I think there was probably a little extra sensitivity to doing something responsible. The ban on DNA experiments put the future of genetic engineering in the balance. Paul Berg warned that if scientists didn't police themselves and control this new technology, then the government might intervene and shut them down. The scientists agreed to meet in California to set guidelines. But one of DNA's founding fathers, Jim Watson, was concerned that airing doubts might awaken public anxiety. Human society has prospered because it tries new things. Some people are afraid to do new things. You know. I guess you call them conservative. I've never been conservative about moving ahead unless I had reason to worry. I thought these people just want the world to stay as it is. And I don't want the world to stay as it is. In what used to be a church in Asilomar, California, 150 scientists gathered from all over the world to discuss the fate of their research. The issue that does bring us here is that a new technique of molecular biology appears to have allowed us to outdo the standard events of evolution by making combinations of genes which could be unique in natural history. For four days, the scientists wrestled with a paradox. They were excited by what recombining genes could tell them about nature, but some were afraid they might damage forever the very life they sought to understand. In the press, the danger became magnified, as if uh, we were equating the danger from recombinant DNA to nuclear energy. In addition to the scientists, a select group of lawyers and journalists had been invited. They were surprised to hear that most of those planning experiments had little experience of handling infectious agents in the lab. It was all too easy to imagine a disaster scenario. Part of what went on was that people in microbiology who were familiar with some of the dangers of the pathogens that were being used experimentally began to educate their molecular colleagues about taking necessary precautions. And they were rather horrified. And some, there were some jokes that w went on, uh, were exchanged about the kinds of things people had done. There are standard microbiological techniques, and one of which is don't eat or drink in the laboratory, which is something that the biochemists and microbial geneticists and other people simply take for granted. Some of the people who were experienced hooted at us and say, you know, you people are so sloppy, you don't even know any of the techniques to work with these kinds of organisms. How could you be contemplating doing something which is possibly of some risk? I was seeing communism in action. They sort of, uh, you know, <laughs> thought police. There were so many things you should worry about. And I just thought this was a minor one for the world. I'm going to take issue with it because you have people around you, and if they're banging on your door saying, you know, we're worried about what you're doing, you try 
to do everything you can to protect them. The point of the conference was to discuss how to make genetic engineering safe, but the delegates couldn't contain their excitement with the science itself. The exchange of scientific information really built up a crescendo of interest among the scientists here. And one of the most interesting places to stand during the breaks in the meeting was near the telephone. People lined up to get to the payphone and to call their labs and say, oh, I've just learned this or that wonderful thing. When I get back next week, we're gonna start on this or that. They were simply learning from each other. The presentations here were cutting edge presentations. I feel very strongly that it is an experiment which should not categorically ever be done, period. As the scientific debate flourished, questions of public safety took a back seat. they were about to receive a reality check. The last night, just before we broke for the beer, uh, was when the lawyers spoke. They were the last ones on the program that night. And they put the fear of, of God into <laughs> people in the audience. It is exhilarating to hear about the delightfully clever things your colleagues have just discovered, so that you may emerge from a session not filled with concern over the hazards, but inspired instead by a desire to pursue the research to the next tantalizing goal. Many people have talked about academic freedom. Freedom of thought does not encompass freedom to cause physical injury to others. I think that not everyone welcomed the lawyers' warnings. I've always disliked them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, because they, uh, they want to put off obstacles. Part I thought of my mission that evening was to, to ask them to step back and re-examine why they were here and to realize that if they didn't do it, there were a lot of people standing uh, uh, around in the rest of society who would be rushing in to do it. Oh, let them sue us. Uh, generally, uh, if you look, Congress only acts after someone gets sick or a disaster. Nothing had happened. So I don't really think laws would have been passed unless something had happened. One biologist shocked the audience with his story of an unorthodox experiment. Sidney Brenner was so convinced the risks were minimal that before he came to a Silomar, he used himself as a human guinea pig. I said, I want to do an experiment uh, on myself. Oh, they said, you should get advice on this. So I said, who should I get advice from? Oh, they say, well, talk to somebody about it. You know, this you've got to do. It's human experimentation. So I sort of said, they didn't tell me who to talk to. So I thought, you know, I could go and talk to someone in a pub and say, what do you think? I'd like to do this experiment. <laughs> However, I did talk to someone. They said, well, they thought it was OK. Brenner grew up strains of genetically modified bacteria and drank them mixed in milk. So there it was. It didn't taste very nice, I have to say. Every day he collected his excrement to search for signs of foreign genes. He didn't find any. For Brenner, that showed that the DNA was broken down in the human gut and rendered harmless. Despite the scatological evidence, the delegates remained divided. After much argument, they decided to grade experiments according to their potential danger. The most hazardous would have to be conducted in sealed labs. The most extreme form of containment would be called P4. Researchers had to wear protective suits with self-contained air supplies. They entered the lab through an airlock. It was like working in space. The guidelines may have been draconian, but at least they were clear. And the government gave the science the stamp of approval. The process of Asilomar created a field, an investment capital field. 
caught the eye of investors, the fact that it might be potentially dangerous, that it was then cleared by the government, got an official imprimatur of safety, made it for investors very romantic and attractive. That's the unintended consequence. The business world was excited. Venture capitalists recognized that genetic engineering was poised to become a highly profitable technology. But their wager on DNA was based on a critical assumption that genetic engineers could protect their invention in the same way as other engineers. The law was put to the test in Chicago in 1978 in a landmark case that determined whether living things could be patented. A young Indian researcher working for General Electric, Ananda Chakrabarti, designed a bacterium that could eat up oil spills. His boss was keen to exploit his ingenuity. He said, have you done anything to make sure that this thing is protected? So I said, uh, I don't get it. How do I protect my invention? And he said, well, you, you first you write a disclosure letter, and then you apply for a patent. And I said, apply for a patent? What's the patent? Every day, the U.S. Patent Office receives hundreds of applications to register original inventions. If successful, these descriptions, or patents, grant ownership of the invention to the inventor and prevent others from copying the idea without permission or payment. Most patents were for mechanical devices. Up until the early 70s, a living organism had never been engineered. Biologists had never thought of themselves as inventors. G had patents on toasters, refrigerators, washing machines, electrical circuits, and so on. And that has never created any problem because we accept the fact that inanimate objects can be patented. The problem came to the fore for the first time when we talked about patenting something that's undoubtedly is useful, but that's living. Living, anything that's living is considered God's creature or a product of nature. Chakrabarti's bacteria ended up in court. General Electric argued that this life form was not a product of nature, but had been created by the minds and hands of humans and could be owned and exploited like any other invention. After months of wrangling, the Supreme Court judges voted five to four in favor of patenting any form of genetically modified life, from bacteria to bull. So when the Supreme Court uh, allowed patenting up life forms, that really, in a sense, opened the floodgate The decision paved the way for a new gold rush. Once it was possible to patent genetically engineered life forms, speculators in cities like San Francisco were eager to invest in DNA. There were plenty of young high rollers willing to take a gamble on manipulating bacteria to make useful commodities, such as drugs. A race began to sign up biologists with bankable ideas. A young venture capitalist, Bob Swanson, set his sights on Herb Boyer, one of the scientists who invented genetic engineering. I uh, called Dr. Boyer. He didn't uh, know me uh, at all. I said that I thought this technology was ready to commercialize and uh, I'd like to talk to him about it. Told me he was a venture capitalist. Uh, I didn't know what venture capitalist was. No, was they, and uh, <clears throat> he said he was interested in, in starting a company. Um, he had some money to do so and that's when I got interested. He said, well, I've been reading about all this technology and you think it can be commercialized? And I said, I think so. Yeah, 
had to estimate what our investment was. So Bob said, well, you know, maybe we'll put up ten, fifteen thousand dollars I said, you're crazy. You know, I don't, I don't have a, you know, I'm operating on a shoestring here as it is. Boyer scraped together $500 and put it down as his share of the joint investment. Bob said, well, we need a name for this company we're going to start. I wrote down Genetic Engineering Technology and come out Genentech. But over on the East Coast in Boston, another scientist became seduced by the commercial potential of biology. This Harvard professor had already made a name for himself in physics and mathematics, but now he saw genetic engineering as the science of the future. His name was Walter Gilbert, and he planned to take on Genentech. A couple of venture capitalists and a group of scientists shared the attitude that the new recombinant DNA technology could make cheaper drugs. Not everybody shared that attitude. The drug companies couldn't care less. They didn't think anything was going to come out of this. They just didn't conceive of the ways of manipulating organisms that this, this group of scientists did. What the scientists shared was a radical vision of hijacking the protein-making machinery of bacteria to churn out drugs. They wanted to produce proteins like insulin or growth hormone that are naturally made in the cells of our bodies. If they could locate the genes for these substances and insert them into bacteria, then these miniature living factories could manufacture drugs on an unlimited scale. One could then ask, well, are there any human proteins which would be of value to make, value to mankind? And insulin was one of the first that one thought of. Insulin has a long history of, as a molecule that saves people's lives. So you could look at insulin and say, here is a molecule you could choose to make. Since the 1920s, insulin had been extracted from the pancreases of pigs and cows to treat diabetics. But tons of meat had to be processed to produce a few grams of the drug. One problem was there was a shortage. Tons of insulin were being made each year to treat diabetics, and the supply of pig pancreases and cow pancreases was a problem. At that time, we didn't have the genes for the insulin, and so the first problem was to try to find the genes actually for the human insulin. Gilbert set himself the tough task of trying to extract from human tissue the small section of DNA that makes up the insulin gene. Different genes are switched on in different organs. In the cells of the pancreas, the insulin gene is very active and churns out many copies of the genetic message needed to make insulin. By extracting these, he planned to produce the exact section of DNA that codes for human insulin. But the question came up whether Harvard would allow him to manipulate human genes in an open lab. Gilbert needed a quick decision. He knew that over on the West Coast, Herb Boyer's team at Genentech was racing for the same prize. Insulin was a, um, it was an obvious, it was what we call a no-brainer, or the low-hanging fruit on the tree. To win the insulin race, Genentech needed a competitive edge. They turned to Dave Goodell. When he joined Genentech, 
he hoped to scale some new peaks. Among them, the grand rock faces of Yosemite. But his biggest challenge was to beat Wally Gilbert to the insulin gene. That, to me, was a, a huge attraction of the project. It was something that was important. Some of the best scientists were working on. It was clear there was a, a competition, and it wasn't something that would be good to come in second, even if you maybe beat a couple of groups. Uh, first place was, was all that really mattered. Goodell devised a novel approach. Instead of extracting the insulin gene from human tissue, like Wally Gilbert, he decided to build it from scratch. Using the four chemical ingredients of DNA, he planned to stitch together the 358 units that form the insulin gene. As this gene would not come from living tissue, it could be produced under normal lab conditions. Gilbert did not take advantage of the synthetic DNA approach, and we did not make any attempt at the natural way. But I think we held them more in awe of uh-oh, uh, uh, we're going to really have to be, be good if, uh, if Wally's working on this project. But Wally Gilbert was running into trouble. Others on the faculty began to raise doubts about undertaking genetic engineering experiments at Harvard. Competition at distance is fine. Competition right down the hall is a very nasty thing. One side would say, this is really the interesting part of science. Can we do things that will benefit humanity? And the other side would say, but undergraduates shouldn't do that. It might be dangerous. The people are at risk and are at benefit from the experiments that are being done with recombinant DNA. The issue had spilled over from Harvard into the newspapers and then got picked up by the local Cambridge politicians. And one of them, Mayor Bellucci, thought that possibly he could make this into an issue of national importance. And so the city council began to debate the issue of, shall we permit such research to go on? They don't even know what, what's going to eventually come out of this experimentation. It could be anything. It could be um, uh, contamination, infections, something that could crawl out of the laboratory, such as a Frankenstein. The fears that had come up at Asilomar returned to haunt Gilbert he had to appear before the city council. Gilbert was banned from working at Harvard and had to find himself a high containment lab elsewhere. He flew his equipment to England, where he was given just four weeks of lab time to complete his human insulin experiment at Britain's top secret germ warfare lab. We had to use much more severe restrictions and worked at Porton Down, which was the British germ warfare establishment, where we could get access to what are called P4 laboratories, laboratories in which you totally change your clothes, shower in, shower out, have gas masks available so that if the alarm goes off, you can sterilize the entire laboratory. It was both extremely frustrating, because extremely hard to work under those conditions, extremely exciting, because we only have a limited length of time. We're working sort of day and night, late into the night, but despite the problems, Gilbert was confident the results looked promising. We went through all the procedure, and we found what we thought was the human insulin gene. While Gilbert's group prepared to bring their results back to the US, news of their breakthrough leaked to Genentech. There were rumors of success, and I got called into Bob Swanson's office, and he was saying, we're counting on you. You better go do it, and don't come back till, till it's done. Meanwhile, Gilbert's team had received confirmation of their results. They had found an insulin gene, but it wasn't human. Gilbert's equipment had previously been used in experiments with rats. Despite his reputation as a meticulous researcher, sloppy cleaning up had just blown two years' work. We discovered that the gel plates were contaminated with material from earlier experiments rather than the material we wanted to find. Very disappointing, since we only had one shot at the experiment. Now it was Genentech's turn to find out whether their approach had worked. On August 24th, we were getting close, and we watched the data coming off the machine, and yes, it had worked. 
and Bob asked two or three times, are you positive? Is this for real? It's not going to be come back a few days later and say, well, we thought we did, but it was wrong. And I uh, was able to convince him, yes, that there could be uh, no, there could be no mistake about this result. For Genentech, the battle was over. Nature would do the rest. Goodell's synthetic insulin gene was copied each time the bacteria divided. All that remained was to ramp up the process until vats of bacteria produced thousands of gallons of this highly profitable drug. Genentech had beaten Wally Gilbert to the prize. You can be lucky and you can go through a moment in which you have the answer and you can say to yourself, nobody else in the world knows this particular thing. Feynman once described, you know, the joys of theoretical physics as that moment in which you know something that nobody else knows. But there are times in which, you know, somebody else knows something you don't know. Today, genetically engineered insulin is used by millions of people. It's one of the many genetically engineered drugs pioneered by Genentech. Herb Boyer's $500 gamble had matured and was now worth half a billion dollars. Despite his scientific achievement, some felt Boyer had sold out. He was shunned by the academic establishment. Today, many think the idea of genetic engineering was as important to modern biology as Watson and Crick's discovery of the double helix. But Boyer and Cohn were never awarded the Nobel Prize. There comes a point in every man's life when he knows that not everybody loves him, and he's being accused of being greedy. But, you know, that's, that's way in the past, doesn't bother me anymore. But it was tough, it was tough at the time. It was difficult to deal with. Today, Genentech is as big as a university campus. Many startup companies have tried to emulate its success. At the heart of this industry is the Boyer and Swanson vision. Each new recruit hopes to share a stake in that dream and pops a penny in the cup for luck. Welcome to Genentech. This is our manufacturing site in Vacaville, California. It is the largest manufacturing site in the world for making protein pharmaceutical products. Herb Boyer and Bob Swanson really were visionaries in terms of what they saw they could accomplish, the risks they were willing to take to try and found a company and, and what became an industry. The site took us about five and a half years to construct. It cost us about a quarter of a billion dollars. This is a three-story facility and the process flows in a, in a very elegant fashion downward from the top floor where we get started, where we first take the master cell bank that has our starting point. To make a biologic product, we are using actual living cells as the factories. And what I have here is one vial of Perceptin that is a treatment that prolongs the lives of women with metastatic breast cancer. So what we're going to show you in this facility is how we've succeeded in scaling up this to something that's capable of producing not one dose, but hundreds of thousands of doses. Uh, to give you an example of the engineering challenges, I think we have 27 miles of piping connecting the various fermenters and the various equipment to each other. 80 liter fermentation tanks, 400 liter tanks, 2,000 liter tanks. That's the train of process that we use to get from really small scale to very large scale. The largest scale that we used here is a 12,000 liter fermentation tank. That tank takes up two stories. It's got about the volume of a gasoline truck. This facility has 12 fermenters in it. And inside each one of those fermenters is the hundreds of billions of cells. This is the bottom of the 12,000 liter fermentation tanks. Here are some of the key purification steps whereby we purify out the protein that we want and get rid of all the things that we're not interested in for commercialization. And what we wind up with at the end is a good quality protein that we can supply to our patients. And that was Genentech, and thank you so much for visiting with us. During the 1980s, the biotech business boomed. The initial targets were genetically engineered drugs designed to help combat major disease like cancer and heart failure.
These success stories gave investors an appetite to chase even bigger markets. Not everyone needs drugs, but we all have to eat. Inspired by his father, who had worked on the Apollo space program, Rob Horsch believed he could make his own giant leap for mankind by becoming the first person to genetically modify plants. He approached a chemical company called Monsanto. The top management at the time viewed it as a high risk, low probability area. And we also had a sense that it was gonna be really hard. But Monsanto had little to lose. Horsch's needs were simple. With a paper punch and a box of multicolored petunias, he planned to show how new traits could be engineered into plants. The first step is to select a really good leaf. The second step was to create a wounded surface. So using a common paper punch, it was possible to make a nice series of uniform sized pieces of the leaf tissue and have a wounded edge all the way around them that could then be inoculated with a broth of agrobacterium. Horsch wanted to use the agrobacterium for genetic engineering. In the wild, these bacteria infect plants with rogue DNA and cause disease. But in the lab, they can be used to deliver new genes into plants. The agrobacterium is already beginning its process of attaching to the cell wall and transferring the DNA into the plant cell. Horsch watched the agrobacteria swarming around the leaf edge. He hoped they were carrying the new genes into the leaf cells to create genetically modified plants. Since this had never been done, and, and there were all kinds of reasons why it might fail, we uh, were just constantly looking for any little sign that it was even working a little bit. First thing in the morning, bright and early, I'd go into the incubators and look at the cultures and see, was something growing? Did it look like the gene might be working? And I couldn't go a whole weekend, so I'd have to come in on the weekends to see if the experiments were starting to work. And lo and behold, one day, they were. The first genetically modified plant was about to flower. The first moment was denial. No, no, it, it can't be true, it can't be true. You had to look under a microscope to see it. And of course, they, they were telling me, oh, you, you're hallucinating, Horsch. I can't see any difference. But truthfully, they could tell. Horsch proudly displayed his new plants to his bosses. Since we were working with petunias, the reaction of top management to this breakthrough was, uh, that's nice. <laughs> what do you think you can do with it? Horsch's colorful display had been an appetizer for his real ambition, to produce genetically engineered food. The idea was to modify farm crops to resist disease and improve yields. If it worked, Monsanto might one day be able to control the planet's food production. For Horsch, the next step was the tomato, an ideal test bed for his technology. Tomatoes had always been difficult. They arrived in shops overripe or infected. Horsch dreamed of engineering a perfect tomato that was resistant to disease. After four years in the lab, his prototype was ready to roll. On June 2nd, 1987, an historic occasion occurred in this field. It was early in the morning when we left Chesterfield uh, Research Center in anticipation of planting the first field test of genetically engineered tomatoes. The air was cool and still that morning, but we were filled with anticipation. We loaded up the first batch and started to plant. 
Porsche was desperate for the world to see the potential of GM food. We worked hard to get uh, media coverage of this because we thought it was a fairly historic event. Uh, and it turned out it was very difficult. After uh, a number of letters and phone calls, all we managed to drum up was uh, one part-time reporter. The world's media may have missed the significance of what was about to happen, but Monsanto had not. Horsch was put in charge of a research effort that would herald the biggest transformation in agriculture since the industrialization of farming. They began by genetically improving cotton and potatoes. Then they moved on to the major food crops, wheat, soybeans, corn, and rice, creating new plants with increased resistance to pests and disease. Today, they're trying to make crops with extra vitamins and are even designing cotton plants that produce multicolored, crease-resistant cotton. But we've gone from a few people working uh, singly in a lab to many dozens of researchers who will work with literally millions of petri plates where the plant cells every year in half a dozen crops trying hundreds or thousands of gene constructions for the products that we're after. And we will put it into a lot of different plant cells uh, to try and discover what works the very best. So ultimately, for each crop, one gene and one cell is the progenitor of what then is grown on millions of acres. But to get that one cell and that one gene, we had to try thousands of different experiments. Genetic engineering experiments that would once have taken years can now be done in hours on a robot assembly line. These wells contain hundreds of different genes that might provide insect resistance. If the genes produce protein that kill insect larvae before they hatch, Monsanto will try engineering them into a plant's DNA. What's possible in the genetic code is vastly larger than what nature has had time to experiment with in evolution. We're seeing the ability to start producing starches and plastics in green plants instead of cement and steel plants. We're seeing the possibility to use proteins in medicine that are grown in green plants instead of fermented in cement and steel plants. In two billion years of evolution, just the bare surface has been scratched of what's genetically possible with the genetic code in DNA. Gradually, the use of genetically enhanced seeds is spreading across the world. 70% of processed food in American supermarkets now contains genetically modified ingredients. But there is global unease, a concern that scientists are playing God before they fully understand the long-term impact on the environment. Some critics worry that a small number of large corporations could end up controlling the seed supply and limit genetic diversity. Many scientists feel the benefits of this technology have not been properly sold to the public. One of the mistakes which I believe the industry made was using modifications that benefit the company and the farmers. The consumer hasn't seen any difference in the quality of the plant necessarily. All he learns about is the possible dangers. The same thing that goes on with making them resistant to certain kinds of pests. Again, what does that do? It increases the farmer's yield. He gets a better crop. The consumer looks at it and says, what did I get out of this? The public fears that surfaced at Asilomar in the 70s returned with a vengeance in Europe in the 90s. But the concerns of the scientists were rarely heard. 
In fact, the protesters were destroying the very test sites where researchers were trying to assess the ecological impact of GM crops. The anger was fueled by mistrust of the profit motive, which drives companies like Monsanto. But there was a deeper, more fundamental fear. In the end, there still will be the problem of people's innate sense of rightness or wrongness about genetically modifying God's creatures. Uh, there are people who seem to want to resist any tampering with the natural state of affairs. What's interesting about those people is they have no qualms about using pharmaceuticals that have been created by genetic engineering. These are unnatural bacteria producing human insulin. So why are they so ready to accept that? Because it provides an immediate benefit. While some people believe that genes from one species should not be shared with another, most scientists see it differently. They believe that they're merely accelerating something that nature's been doing for billions of years. Only time will reveal the full results of this man-made global experiment. DNA is so far not proved to be dangerous. No one has got sick at all. It's been perhaps the safest technology ever introduced. So, you know, when you know you can do good, and maybe there's no risk, do you assume that it's going to be the worst or the best? And uh, I think you have to, with prudence, assume that things will turn out well. Since the advent of the combinant DNA, you can see that biology is moving very, very rapidly. And the rest of the society cannot keep pace. So there would be all these struggles between the society and what you call the scientific free spirit to take our DNA from what it's doing now to what perhaps it could do in the future if it's manipulated sufficiently by people who are determined to do it. But I'm absolutely sure that tinkering of the DNA will be part of that evolutionary process and that the evolution will go on. The most dramatic results of this revolution have yet to be seen. As biologists attain a deeper understanding of DNA, the future evolution of plants and animals will be within their grasp. Perhaps one day they might even be able to control the destiny of the human species.